Hello, I'm Claire Yan again. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce the speakers in this year's Lived Expertise panel, um, including Teresa Ford, Agilsa Fernandez, and Ron Unger, who will speak to the ways in which they lead their own stories. As sometimes happens in our meetings, Agilsa is the only member of the original panel. Carlton Whitmore was not able to be here due to unexpected demands at work. And Dmitry Gutkovich, who had also been scheduled to speak, is in the hospital with his wife, who is giving birth to their first child. Dmitry sent a few words to open this panel. Um, children assume that two people on opposite sides of a wall can see each other, since everyone must see the world exactly as they do. Adults, on the other hand, pretend that we have outgrown this problem. Experts by experience are a community of millions whose unique vantage point adds significant value to academics, providers, and support structures. As we improve quality of life for our community, thank you for defending our right to be a central part of the narrative. This is the topic of greatest mastery of our lives. And now for today's presenters. Agilsa Fernandez, our first speaker, is a peer advocate at Northwell Health and is active in the disability rights movement. While a student at SUNY Stony Brook, they founded the Peer Mental Health Alliance. They are also the newly elected secretary of ISPS US and like Shakun Mathai, is a winner of the 2020 Bazelon Center's Award for Mental Health Advocacy. Teresa Ford um, is a Master's in Divinity candidate at the Candler School of Theology. She works as a certified peer specialist in metropolitan Atlanta and holds a certificate certification in psychosocial rehabilitation and is also an active leader with the Hearing Voices Network. And Ron Unger, a longtime ISPS US member and chair of the um, Education Committee, is a, has, is a therapist, family member, and person with lived experience. Um, as chair of the Education Committee, he helps promote events and produce materials that promote liberatory approaches to psychosis. So, Agilsa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Agilsa. Um, a pleasure to have you all here. Um, I am brown, queer, non-binary, Latinx person with psychosis. These intersectional identities are vital in telling my story. I first experienced auditory and visual hallucination in college. And at the time, I didn't know where to turn because all I ever heard was suicide and depression, suicide and depression, suicide and depression. So I told myself, okay, I know that I can go to a counselor when I'm experiencing suicide ideations or depression, but who do I turn to and where do I turn if I'm experiencing hearing voices or seeing things? And so I didn't know where to turn. And all I've ever knew about psychosis came from the media, from books I read, from films I saw. And in all of those things, the person was always put in a straight jacket, thought of as monster or scary or a criminal, a horrible person basically. And it wasn't until two years later that I sought help from a therapist. And throughout that process, it was invalidating, really. I had therapists tell me, are you sure that you're queer? Why don't we explore your sexuality? Maybe you're not queer. Maybe that's not really what you are. Have you explored with guys? Uh, are you sure that you don't wanna be with guys? It was very invalidating and it actually further caused harm. I left the sessions feeling more depressed, hearing more voices, and seeing more things. Furthermore, I had therapists who didn't understand the cultural background that I came from, nor how racism impacted me. 
So most of our sessions were spent on addressing what does it mean to me? Why is it racist? How is it that being Latinx impacts my psychosis? How does it come to play? Instead of spending my sessions actually speaking about perhaps coping skills or ways that I can create a safety and healing environment for myself, I spend it educating my therapist and my psychiatrist. For months, it was about learning terms and these intersectionalities rather than healing, rather than addressing what was going on. So these things became about exploring racism, my sexuality and my gender more than psychosis, which is why I went in in the first place. For me, it took peers to help me. They walked the journey prior to me and they knew what worked and what didn't work. Heck, over seven therapists and psychiatrists told me that I would never go back to work, that I can never go back to school and that I can never do the things that I loved. The peers were the ones to say, don't listen to them, they're liars, don't even listen to them. Here's what you can do and here's how you're gonna get to your goals. And that's how I basically returned to schools, uh, returned to school. So some of the things that the peers suggested to me were listening to music when I was hearing voices, feeling cold surfaces when I felt that I was away from reality, tapping my feet or feeling my feet on the ground to snap me like back into this reality and keeping notes when I felt that my memory wasn't so great. All this to say I graduated magnum culotte from a university who specifically told me to drop out. I had gone to them for help and what they said was drop out, not accommodations, not here's resources, but drop out. Because people like me couldn't possibly make it in a highly academic school. Those were the words that they told me. Turns out there are discriminatory policies in place across universities in the US, which are called medical leave policies. But that's a conversation for another time. So all of this to say that having a therapist for a person like me with all of these intersections isn't enough. It wasn't until I met a trans, queer therapist of color that I actually started to grow to reach my goals and most importantly and most importantly live the life that I wanted to live. With her, I didn't need to explain racism, queerness, being non-binary, or being a person of color. In fact, she was the one to challenge me when it came to decolonizing. Decolonization is a process of its own, and it is very painful. It's a process of undoing internalized racism and externalized racism. It's so beautiful when someone else witnesses that process with you and holds space with you through that pain. Through the, colon through the colonization work, I realized that centuries ago, my ancestors didn't see psychosis as an illness. Rather, they saw it as a gift. One of my aunts who recently passed away will always tell me, Ajilsa, what you have is a gift, a gift that you will be able to control eventually. Between my aunt, therapist, and peers, I learned holistic ways to balance my extreme states. I have been off medications for about six years. These people of color taught me to embrace the voices and visions and not run away from them. Trying to run away from them was what was creating the turmoil. I went from not being able to leave my house, not able to work at all, not able to use my bathroom and perform my basic needs to obtaining a bachelor's, working with Facebook, working with candidates on campaigns, 
community organizing, and working in other spaces. All this to say, this was done by accepting the psychosis rather than trying to shun it. The tools that have worked best for me are tools that are rooted in the decolonizing work. When I look at presenters, literatures, magazines, organizations, and campaigns that address the psychosis, there are barely, if any, people who look like me. There is a lack of representation. How can I heal if the providers, peers, and absolutely everything that surrounds me is telling me this is for white people and not for you? Furthermore, how can I heal in spaces that are not safe nor validating of my intersectional experiences? Therefore, we must ensure that practices are anti-racist and inclusive of intersectional experiences. We must ensure that at the table, the decision-making table, that it has voices that are active, voices that come from diverse backgrounds, gay, trans, queer, non-binary, people of color, black, indigenous folks with lived experiences. The New York State Peer Certification doesn't have one, not one single session on LGBTQIA plus trainings, trans and gender non-conforming trainings, nor racial trainings. There are many programs created without our, our black and brown voices, yet they try to service us. These services in turn end up being more harmful than good. Intersectionality and diversity must be addressed at the decision-making table. People have asked me, Ajilsa, where can my where can my black, trans, queer friend go for support when they're experiencing psychosis and where they will feel safe? The answer is always the same, nowhere. We have hospitals and centers and communities and peers that are more safer than others, but none of these places are 100% safe. And they won't be until we truly are committed to anti-racism and intersectionality. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to me. I'm going to hand it over to Ron. For your experience. Oh, maybe I just got unmuted now. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm happy we're talking about bringing a focus on love and justice into our work with extreme states. Um, I think the flip side of, of that is having an awareness of how extreme states can be a meaningful reaction to injustice and a lack of love. And, and when we can connect with people about the meaning of their experience and their process and how it is a reaction to what happened and what was missing, then, then that really helps people start to be a person again. So one thing, one, th one thing about madness or psychosis or extreme states or whatever we call it is how it's really tricky. And, and everything's up for question. Like, um, I just assumed that it's a goal to help people feel like a person again. Um, but that actually wasn't always my goal when I was in far out places on my own journey. Um, but one thing I really wanna emphasize today is, is how, while we often think of psychosis as the problem, um, a lot of what's going on is often someone is experimenting with finding a solution to some kind of problem that came before the psychosis. Because um, in the psychosis is often a, an effort to find a solution and that's why it can be a gift, like Ajilsa was saying. Now it's true that extreme states often become a problem for people, um, but those same extremes are often a kind of superpower in another sense, that they're part of a solution. And we really need to 
understand that dual nature if we really want to connect with people and help them. So, so you might ask, uh, how might, say, experiencing oneself as uh, not a person be a superpower or a solution to a problem? Well, here's my story. Um, I grew up in a, in a poor family, and I was abused a lot at home. Now, actually, looking back on it and analyzing what happened, I can see where some of that abuse actually came out of um, the fact that uh, my mom identified with her Irish Catholic background, which been, had been oppressed, and then in fighting back against that oppression, she actually got me caught up in abuse, but it's a complicated story. But anyway, I was bullied at home. I was abused at home, and then I became a target for the bullies out in the community. Um, and that happened a lot. And then also there was the fact that my own feelings about myself, I was mostly feeling um, I, feeling like a gay person, feeling attracted to men and or boys at the time, obviously, and in a climate that was very anti-gay at the time. So all these things were affecting me. And basically my sense of self was that I, there was no justice for me in this world. I couldn't be loved. I was not lovable. Um, and then around, you know, 17, I discovered psychedelic drugs and all of a sudden realized, hey, th I can see things completely differently. Uh, my first experience tilted me into that kind of like psychotic zone because I felt like I'd gone into a very deep place. And I realized nothing had to be the way it was. Everything could be rearranged, basically. And I decided I wasn't the person I had been. I didn't want to be. I'd become a person, a 17-year-old person, but I didn't want to be that person anymore. I wanted to be something else. I basically disowned my childhood and actually that continued to be disowned until I was in my 30s. <laughs> but now if you'd had my kind of childhood, you might understand why I would want to do that. But of course, disowning all that left me very ungrounded. You know, typically it's said that schizophrenia is the breakdown of a sense of self and a sense of the world. Um, but I didn't really want to be the self that I had been. Um, and I didn't want to believe in the world that I had had come to see. It kept me locked in that sense of oppression. Um, you know, it still kind of makes sense to me if if I'm in a world or a system where love is impossible, then destroy the world. Just destroy it. And that's kind of like the outrage piece. We talked about love and outrage. <laughs> um, but when, you know, everything is oppressive, you just want to blow it up. But if I wasn't this person I had become, who was I? What was I? Um, well, one thing it helped to just think of myself as like a creative spirit or, or force or, or, or that I was God or one with God, um, or I was nobody or no one. Um, I was the void or, or the void was also God. I mean, there were all sorts of mental states and ways of looking at it. Um, and the world, you know, I started thinking, well, it can be anything I want it to be. Um, or, um, you know, a key insight for me was that we're, we're always making interpretations about how to look at things. And, and you know, actually, as you know, you hear therapists talk about stuff like that. Well, it's not what happens to you. It's what you make of it. But I was taking that in a much more radical way. <laughs> and um, this led to a sense that, you know, any fixed idea about the world was absurd. And it made sense to, um, you know, like break apart usual ways of thinking by randomly associating things, you know, again, loose associations, it's often thought of as a symptom, but in another sense, it's a superpower because it's a sense that you de deconstruct everything and, and realize, hey, I can make different associations to things. And I'd sometimes write or even sometimes talk in really bizarre ways. Um, and, and even though we think of things like meaning, purpose, connection, as fundamental to a good existence, I was interested in undoing any fixed sense of meaning, purpose, or connection because I was afraid of being trapped by it. You know, I was afraid of being trapped the way I had been when I was a younger person. Um, you know, like being trapped in ideas of love that had no room for the kind of feelings I actually had um, sexually or romantically. Um, Anyway, I had this sense that that 
as God or one with God, I could reinvent the universe by seeing or think of thinking of it differently, you know? And I was willing to admit that that others were technically God also, but I was better than most of them because I was aware of it and they weren't. So there was this grandiosity in there. Again, learn later as a therapist, well, grandiosity is often compensating for shame. But um, at the same time, there's, there's something to it being able to, I mean, people all over the world actually have found that I, uh, recognizing the sense that their identity is one with God is actually a helpful and a positive thing if you do it in the right way. Of course, when people are in extreme states, they often haven't yet learned how to do it the right way, like Jills is saying, you haven't yet learned how to use your gifts. Um, but that's what I think the mental health system should be doing is helping people learn to use their gifts rather than helping them think that, um, you know, that it's completely a bad thing. Because often what we do in extreme states are half a good thing and they're half something that can be very terrible. And when you don't know how to use it, of course, you tend to make a mess. But people can learn how to use it. So I sometimes saw my role as something like a prophet, you know, as to wake people up to all the things that I was becoming aware of about how I could recreate myself. Um, now, one thing that helped me, I think, is I did have a determination at some point to figure out how to make sense to people, but I also didn't want to get stuck just um, believing what everyone else believed and making sense that way. I wanted to bring something unique into the world. Um, and, Sometimes that was, you know, it's going off odd tangents. Like at one point, despite, despite the fact that I didn't really understand very much math, I believed I had ideas that were going to revolutionize physics and radically change our understanding of the cosmos. Um, you know, I had to back away from some of that when I realized, well, this doesn't always make as much sense as I, I thought it did. But some of it I can still find sense in, though. But a key theme in that. Um, was that I had this sense, you know, there was a sense of my, myself and the world that was defective or ruined and really needed to be destroyed. Something needed to be destroyed. But then there was also an inner truth or an inner version of myself in the world that, that needed to be kind of like born into existence. And that's the same thing that John Weir Perry identified as a really key theme in often psychosis generally. Um, but I, I think this this revelation aspect of some of these experiences, it's not just confusion. There's often a revelation side to it. Um, so what happened with me and my journey was that I never did end up in the psychiatric system. I got help from from people around me. I mean, there were people that, that there were definitely a lot of people during this time that thought of me as crazy or, um, and, you know, yeah, you're schizophrenic. That's what must be what's going on or recommended I go to a psychiatrist, but I'd actually been studied mental health somewhat. And I was also studied critical thinkers like R.D. Lang. And so I had the idea, hey, I don't want to go to those psychiatrists. Um, and, but there is also like a lot of people, um, you know, um, do things that are too extreme when they're having extreme states where I was maybe more cowardly and timid. I didn't do things quite that extreme. Um, and so I managed to stay, you know, out of anybody forcing me into care. Um, but I think actually with a lot of people that are going through extreme states, we can teach them to be a little more cautious. Hey, maybe what you're going through would be okay if you just tone down this part of it, you won't get in trouble. Um, you know, I managed to tone myself down, but we can maybe help people tone themselves down a little bit. But we don't want to tone people down too much because actually this disruption, there's something good about it. There's something that has to happen. Um, now, I got a little good guidance also because I was somebody that read a lot and so I was reading stuff by mystics and rebels and, you know, people that were exploring altered states of consciousness. And this kind of helped me find something good in my experiences. And uh, it also helped that I went through this in a period of time that uh, was pretty tolerant, the early 70s, when, for example, being a freak in many quarters was considered to be a good thing. And it also helped that I eventually moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, where 
I got involved with groups like uh, the San Francisco Suicide Club, which is really an urban adventure or prankster group. Um, now, the, there was a news show in Berkeley at the time that said, if you don't like the news, go out and make some news of your own. And uh, in the Suicide Club, we sort of had this thing, if you don't like reality, go out and make a reality of your own. So we did some pretty weird things. And but that sense of being able to join with others and being creative in something, something new and different was really a positive thing. And uh, also got involved in some other kind of groups that were really helpful. And um, so eventually found that I could make some sense to people. And then as I, you know, I found other people who found some value in what I was thinking and the way I was looking at things, then I got a lot more interested in making sense to others. And that of course allowed me to tone down some of what I was doing to make sense more and find a way to, to, to fit my truth in with other people's truth and to collaborate. Now later, a lot of my younger siblings went on similar kind of journeys. Um, and some, you know, uh, you know, got fell into the mental health system and all that. And I thought what they're getting really isn't that helpful. They, they need more of the kind of help that I got. Um, and that's why I eventually got in the mental health system and tried to provide that kind of help. Um, so anyway, big fear I had when I was going through all this was that I would be identified as just crazy. You have nothing to offer. You're just crazy. And that's what I saw happening to my siblings when they got in the mental health system. But what I really want to see happening is where, you know, people have it valued that, hey, maybe there's something important in what's going on. Maybe you're, you know, you're going through this journey where you're looking for something better than um, the, you know, what you learned up till now. A central metaphor that I use now is that psychosis is like revolution. You know, when we revolt against oppression, many new opportunities open up. And that's true, even though revolution, as we know, in countries can open up horrors or slipping into way worse dysfunction, but it also has the possibility of opening up, you know, new possibilities. Um, and I think as mental health workers, we often come in feeling like our job is to suppress the psychosis or suppress the revolution. Uh, but instead, I think our role should be more like peacemakers. And as we know, there's, there's no peace without justice and there's no real peace without love. Uh, so let's be willing to, to meet people at the place before the world and the self was constructed. Um, and it's there we can help people find or construct a sense of the world and a sense of themselves that is built in a way that includes love and justice. So uh, thanks for listening and I'll turn it over to Teresa. Go ahead. Hi, uh, like Ron said, my name is Teresa um, and I'm a voice hearer. Um, and I want to tell you how I got to this point in my life. Um, I don't remember a time when I didn't hear things, although I didn't know to call them voices. Um, so as a very young child, I thought everyone had this ongoing dialogue in their head. And when I talked to my grandmother about it, she said, well, that's the Holy Spirit, which didn't really mean that much to me back then because I wasn't raised in the church, but I knew from the way she said it that it was something good. And so I didn't have any reason to be afraid of it. And so my experiences went on for most of my childhood, which unfortunately was very abusive. Um, and so when I moved into my early 20s and was preparing to go to graduate school, my experiences started to be problematic for me. Uh, up until that point, um, the dialogue had been positive. Um, I had received really good advice from the voices and um, they were a comfort. And then as I moved into my 20s, they began to say things about me to me that were very disturbing and frightening. Um, so I went into uh, therapy 
but I didn't talk about the voices. I only talked about being sad. So I was labeled um, with major depressive disorder and was treated for that for many, many years. Um, but I did go on to graduate school um, and graduated with a 4.0. Um, and this is without medication. This is without being in therapy. This is without seeing a psychiatrist. And then I went on uh, to have my, my son, who's now an adult, um, and I raised him alone. And it wasn't until he was about six or seven that the experiences started to be a problem again uh, and interrupt my life and made made it very difficult for me to do the kinds of things that I wanted to do, uh, like work and socialize and um, be in healthy relationships. So I again went to a psychiatrist and, um, but I didn't talk about the voices initially and was told that I had bipolar disorder. So I was treated for bipolar disorder for several several years until one day the voices got so loud that I sat down with a pen and paper and just wrote down everything I heard. And when I told my therapist about that experience and read to her the things that were being said, she kind of went pale and said, you need to tell your psychiatrist about this. So I did. And that landed me with a schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type diagnosis. And it was kind of frightening because once I got that diagnosis, the doctor said that they didn't think it was really a good idea that I should be raising my son. Um, they were convinced that I would never work again, that basically I would never contribute anything to society again, that I should just... Uh, uh, get social security disability and just sit home and wait for a check. Um, that my my greatest goal should be just not to be hospitalized again. And unfortunately, I believe them. And so for almost eight years, that's, that's what I did. Um, I, I continued to raise my son uh, alone, but I didn't work a full-time job. I was a afraid to based on what they had told me, which was that the stress would be too much and that I would be back in the hospital. So I worked small jobs here and there um, from home. Um, and then one day my therapist suggested I go to a peer center to socialize because I was very isolated. And I resisted for several weeks and then finally went and I was just amazed because here were people with the same label as me, the same diagnosis, who were living their lives out loud and just thriving. Um, these were individuals who ran the center. These were individuals who ran the parent organization of the center um, and they were happy and they weren't frightened and they were working and doing all sorts of things, despite the label they had been given. So it just so happens that the executive director was there the day I went to visit. And I said to her, you know, I would really like to work here. And she said, okay, we'll apply. So I did. And she hired me. And less than a year later, I was a certified peer specialist. And it was a transformative event because I could use what had been told to me was was really a curse to bless other people. I could use just my experience of um, voice hearing and depression and all the other things that went with it. I could use those things to help other people. So I had a purpose again. And for seven years, I worked for medical facilities. I worked for hospitals, clinics as a peer specialist. And it was really wonderful because the people I met had bought into what the psychiatrist had said, that they would never work again, that they couldn't accomplish anything, couldn't do anything except stay out of the hospital. And when they met me and before they knew I had the same label, they looked at me with skepticism. 
And as we talked and I revealed that I had the same diagnosis, it gave them hope that they actually could do the things that they wanted to do. They could live on their own, have a car, have a job, have friends, socialize and be happy. So that was really transformative for me, just coming in contact with peers um, and people who, like I said, were living out loud. So how did I get to this point? Uh, I'm in seminary and I'm earning a master's of divinity. Well, as a peer specialist, what I found was that when I was able to talk to the people that I was working with about their idea of what a higher power was, they felt better. They just felt better. And it wasn't really policy to talk about higher power issues. Um, it was actually frowned upon by the hospitals I worked at and the clinics I worked at. But I knew that these conversations were important. And so I wanted to find a way to be able to talk to as many people as possible um, who were struggling about how God is present. You know, even in the struggle, God is present. So, um, you know, I, I, I heard a voice that said, you're going back to school. And I said, no, I'm not, because I didn't want to go back to school. And um, the voice was persistent. So I started looking at schools online and uh, was encouraged by my faith community and my and the peers that I'm friends with to apply. Um, mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I got in. And then another voice said, don't worry about the money. It'll come. And sure enough, it came so that I could pay for it, uh, the education. And and now my hope is that once I'm finished with the degree, I will be able to work as a hospital chaplain. And as a hospital chaplain, I will meet people from all walks of life, people with extraordinary experiences like mine, people who've never heard a voice before in their lives. Um, and I'll be able to share with them that God is present and that God is a, a sure source of help. So I look forward to the future now. Um, I mean, I have good days and I have not so good days, but mostly I have good days. And um, and that's really thanks to my experiences with, with the peer support. So at that, I guess I will turn it over for questions. very much um, all of you for your contributions to this panel. Um, so we are again having some technical problems. Um, so unfortunately we won't be able to take questions from the audience, um, but I've come up with a couple of questions that I thought we could use to keep the conversation uh, going. And I also would encourage the three of you if you have any, anything that resonated with you um, or anything that you wanted to comment on from the other presentations, um, hopefully uh, this is an opportunity to do, to do that. Um, so uh, well, I'm just gonna ask and pose a question to the three of you first. So, I mean, all three of you are people with lived experience, are part of the peer movement um, and are also in traditional mental health systems to some degree as practitioners. And I'm curious, you know, it kind of brings me back to something from Taku's talk of like, how can we make, should we make change from the inside or from the outside? And it seems like you are all making change from the inside. And I just, I'm curious if you could reflect a little bit on what that's been like for you um, and maybe advice you would have to other people mm -hmm. who maybe are playing with the idea of, um, getting peer support licensure and how they can kind of navigate straddling both of those worlds or multiple worlds um, at one time. Uh, this is Ajilsa. So for me, I come from a 
disability justice background. I'm very involved in the disability community. And we have this motto of nothing about us without us. So I'm a very firm believer that the peer who I'm working with is the one leading. And the system is not that way. <laughs> the system tends to throw things at you. Like you should do this or you should do that rather than exploring. And But that exploration coming from the peer um, so I, I, the way I've dealt with it is I have to go home and I do this religiously and I have to say, okay, I am not part of the system. I am in the system, but I'm not part of the system so that I can continue to do the work that I really want to do, which is just to work with the peer at a peer level. And I have to do that consistently because the system places us in um, in a hierarchy. You know, I'm seen as having clients rather than peers, or I'm the one leading rather than the peers leading. So there's a lot of battle there, and so I have to come go home and remind myself while I'm doing this work so that I can continue this work. And furthermore because I think in a very decolonized mentality, I have to center people's experiences and say, well, how am I gonna show up for that person today and continue that, that structure of decolonizing? So that's, that's what it's like for me. I can definitely relate. Um, as a peer specialist working at a hospital, for example, on an ACT team, there was definitely that um, that hierarchy, which I tried to break down um, whenever I worked with someone. Um, but then there was also this hierarchy within the staff where the doctors were on top and the peer specialists were on bottom. Um, and that definitely was reflected in the pay. <laughs> so um, so it, it was difficult, but it was doable to work in that system. Yeah. Um, I think Cheku earlier said that if you're going to do this work, you have to be willing to sometimes put yourself at risk and possibly get fired. I've only been fired from a minor position, but uh, my background was I actually first was as an outsider of the system. Uh, like I was part of Mind Freedom for many years and doing protests and, you know, speaking out and stuff like that. But then we kept saying there should be alternatives. There should be alternatives. And so uh, at a certain point, I thought, well, maybe I should go to school and become somebody that's providing alternatives. And that's how I became a therapist. Um, but then I also talked in my presentation about you know, trying to create our own reality. And I think to some extent, you know, we find ourselves in a system that tells you to do it a certain way, but you can sometimes just start doing it a different way. Um, Michael Cornwall is a friend of mine who has worked as a therapist and he, he started in places that were real progressive, like where, you know, alternative places where they didn't give people medications and try to just support people when going through stuff. But then those got shut down and he got put in a traditional mental health system where they told him they were just managing an illness and all this. And so he'd nod his head and go, yeah, yeah. And then he'd go off and do the really kind of collaborative work that Jill is talking about. And he would just, you know, do what needed to be done and, and just rebel that way. So that's a possibility too. But I think it's good when we can try to tweak the whole, speak out and tweak the whole system. And that's a lot of what I try to do edu as an educator and, and, and stuff like that. And it really helps to find a friendly agency. Like I do a lot of my work in an agency that's just friendly and, you know, so it's, I don't have to worry about it, but I also put my foot in the door of the state hospital. It's a little more shaky there. I'm still figuring out how to do that and try to actually make a positive difference and not just become part of the, the system, but something that kind of like tries to make a difference. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of brings me to a, a question that we started to 
t- touch upon a little bit, if you were to give like concrete advice to someone who is playing with this idea of, you know, being a peer specialist, Jill said one of the recommendations you have is like going home at night and telling yourself like, I am not the system. Um, but I wonder if there's any other <laughs> advice that you all might have for, for those who might be playing with this idea. I would say definitely go for it. Um, it can only enrich your life. Um, and then the process of assisting other people in their healing, you are continually healed. I would also uh, say, think about different ways you might position yourself in the system. I mean, you can do, I mean, I think the whole system should work more like peer work. And so somebody might decide I want to become a psychiatrist, but then work at more of a peer level, work very collaboratively and say, hey, I know a little about pills, but you know about yourself. Let's see if we can work together to, to help you. And, you know, there's room to do that or become, a, you know, if um, getting your social work degree helps. I know people that have worked as a peer specialist and then decided, hey, you know, why not I get my social work degree and they'll pay me more and I can do a few more things. And then maybe a you know, the system needs tweaks so it doesn't work the way it does now. But mean, but before it does that, people can figure out different places to infiltrate. Now, another thing is sometimes you have to think about how open you're going to be about your views as you go through certain training programs, because some are really friendly to people with lived experience. And some people have found they had to during, at a certain point in there, as they were learning something to, to, to go undercover, you know, and to, and then, and then come out, hey, by the way, did you know, I was one of those people that you were talking about. And, and sometimes you actually have more impact that way. If they screen you out at the beginning, you don't have much impact. But if you kind of slip in under the radar, and then, because a lot of people have slipped under the radar and never spoken out, that's not very helpful. You, you know, if you do slip under the radar, then at a certain point, you want to make your stand and <laughs> so they know who you are. And I would say, um, before you even consider this work, think about your objectives in life. Because if we talked about this in, er, in the earlier, sorry, earlier in the opening, where this job, and I have to be quite honest, is quite oppressive. It very much is. It's oppressive in the sense, as Teresa was saying, where there's this hierarchy, uh, you know, and you have to continuously advocate for equity. And because you're bringing as much knowledge to the table and as much skills to the table. But this paper that says therapist or psychiatrist, it's like, whoa, I'm higher than you. I'm better than you. My opinions are higher than you. And that's not true. In my experience, like I mentioned earlier, and and I can relate so much to Teresa, I healed and I progressed because of peers. It wasn't therapists and psychiatrists. They were the addition. <laughs> the main folks were the peers. Um, so we have a lot to contribute and we're still not there as far as the system where we're valued equally and in that equal contribution. So really consider that and also consider the pay. The pay is horrendous. The pay is right now, I can say, and I'll say it openly because of COVID, I've gone to sleep at night hungry. I've struggled, you know, am I going to pay my rent or am I going to eat? And these are very hard decisions. The system places us, well, because you have lived experience, you deserve the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is you're barely surviving. You're barely, you're not even thriving. You're barely surviving. So if this, if the person is looking for a part-time or something to start off, this is a great job, but I personally don't see myself here long-term because there's so many oppressions to it. So really think about what are your objectives. On the other hand, I don't wanna say all the negatives, right? There's a lot of positives. I do love my job. I love the work I do. Like Teresa said, I it's so healing for me. I love the client, uh, the peers. And I say client because that's the part of the system, but I love the peers I work with. But um, 
knowing that, what do you want to bring and what are your contributions? Because to me, getting to work with them every single day and vice versa, just having this communal discussion is impactful both ways. So really, really consider what do you want to do and where do you want to be? That's great. Thank you. I mean, I think we're, there's two different ways I we could go here, but I'll, I'll try to get, we, hopefully we have enough time for both of them. Um, but I think what we're, one of the things that we're talking about and dancing around is like, the stigma of having been labeled with a mental health diagnosis while also working in the mental health system and all of the um, kind of barriers. I mean, even just how much you're getting paid, I think that that's kind of indicative of the stigma around being a mental health practitioner while also having lived experience. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone has any kind of comments or thoughts. And I was actually thinking, Teresa, in light of your talk too, um, you know, what, how, how does that look? How does that stigma look in the spiritual community? Um, it is, is that the same? Is it different? Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on, on that. Um, there's quite a bit of stigma in seminary for people who have mental health challenges. And my response to that was, uh, to do a blog piece and just basically come out and say, yes, I have a diagnosis. Um, but I also have a master's degree, you know, and I'm working on a second master's degree. And so for, you know, for people who that's a priority, you know, the higher education, it gave validity to my situation and it made, it normalized my situation. And I can't tell you how many people wrote to me and said they were so glad that I came out and said that, you know, that I had a diagnosis because they had a diagnosis too, you know, and, and so it normalized things for them as well. Um, any other thoughts on that? I have one more question, um, but just want to leave space for any other thoughts. I mean, we've kind of talked about this in implicit ways, but I'm wondering if there's any other explicit thoughts that anybody has about the stigma yeah. around working in this in the system and also being subject to the system. It seems like these days, it varies quite a bit. I mean, you can find some circles where having lived experience gives you more credibility and mm -hmm. you actually get listened to more. And then you can find other ones where they're shocked, where they, someone with lived experience would think they have anything to contribute at all <laughs> other than just a, you know, so um, we're in a transition point and it's kind of funny. That's just one observation. Sorry, I think everyone pretty much uh, covered it. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I have one more question and then maybe we can stop there or, and, you know, um, after that, if you have any other comments um, for one another. Uh, but my last question is um, for, I mean, it's mostly related to something Adjilsa mentioned, um, but I think it can be applicable to any of you. Um, you know, you talk about this experience of having, so I, I am a therapist. I was trained to, in, as, in regards to understanding someone's identity and their context, I was always taught, you know, ask them their experience of their cultural identity, um, ask them their, you know, ask their perspective and, you know, obviously don't make any assumptions. Um, and I think that that's really helpful on one hand. And I think it's really unhelpful on the other hand, because it sounds like in your case, that it left you in this position of feeling like you had to educate your therapist. And it wasn't until you had someone with a, like a marginalized identity that you felt like you could benefit from the therapy and that you didn't have to, that there was maybe some shared language or some shared experience that allowed you to utilize the therapy better. So I'm wondering like what maybe advice, I don't know if that's the right way to frame it, but what can you say to therapists who maybe do not share the same kind of cultural identity 
our intersections as our patients on how to both honor the client's experience and try to understand their perspective without, again, like expecting them to um, provide education in a more general context. I would say the therapist needs to know when they have to refer out and not feel bad about that. They have to be comfortable. Not every time you're going to match up with that person. And that's okay. It's all right if you refer them to someone else. Um, there's plenty of white folks, for example, who understand um, to, of course, to a certain degree, but very well-rounded, the struggles of black, brown, and indigenous folks. They, they have sat in um, social justice spaces. They have listened. They are very well informed. And so a lot of people feel comfortable. But then there's therapists who don't know what they're talking about and pretend to know. And that's the worst thing that can happen because you're spending your sessions having this person train you when you should be going to the training yourself and paying for that training. This is a person that's paying you to get help. Instead, they're paying you so that you can learn for free off of their emotions and trauma, which further traumatizes it, traumatizes them and harms them. So we have to be really careful, you know, basically asking ourselves, can I serve this person? Can I be helpful? Because if the answer is no, and I'm gonna cause more harm, then it's better to just refer out. I had really quick, sorry, I had a, I identify as non-binary and I had a therapist um, say, I totally understand trans um, issues. So you're he and automatically try to put their pronouns on me, doesn't even ask me, but quote, quote, understands transgender issues and then says things amongst the line like, oh, and so do you, what do you wear and reflective of my body and things that made me feel uncomfortable? And I'm like, yeah, you don't really understand. If you truly understand, you wouldn't be asking me these questions that causes me dysphoria. dysphoria. So we really have to acknowledge how much do we understand the person we're serving? Because if you have someone and they're coming to you with all the, of these intersections, race, gender, age, so forth, and you don't really understand them, how can you really be of service? Yeah. As far as transferring out, I think sometimes that there's somebody available who is a better, likely a better fit, and that, and that is a good idea to do. Other times, people, therapists are in a position, there is nobody better to transfer to. And then I think it's a combination of, um, trying to become competent in, in understanding the person's issues by being showing an interest in trainings and all that that you pay for and all that. But also cultural humility, which is just where, you know, hey, I recognize I, I don't understand everything about trans and I'm sorry, I wish I did. I'd probably be more helpful, but maybe we can work together and we can figure it out together. And it's that humility is, you know, it's not always as good as really being informed, but it's a, it at least allows you to work sometimes. And, and also people can be so different. Like you might think, oh, this person is Hispanic. I'm very educated in Hispanic issues, but then you find out they come from some little village, which has its own little traditions and is very different than most of, you know, and, and there's, there's stuff that is way different than what you might've been educated in. So we gotta be open to people's uniqueness. I think that that's a very appropriate way to end this panel. Um, a reminder to be open to people's uniqueness. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to ask you questions from the audience, but hopefully um, people will still be able to enjoy uh, your presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.